Good afternoon. And we will wait just a moment for all of the folks who are coming in from the waiting room to connect here with us. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we have spent a bit of time over the first couple weeks of session here reviewing um, the 2020 election uh, because it was an unprecedented uh, election in many ways, uh, no, no, not only because of the high participation rate of Vermonters, um, but because it was done um, at a much higher percentage by mail or uh, absentee ballot than has ever been before. So um, we have heard from the Secretary of State's office and I thought it was important for us to spend a fair bit of time uh, hearing from the folks who actually administer our elections um, on the ground in our towns and cities. And so um, thank you to Carol Dawes for, uh, for, for joining us and also for helping to uh, bring along perspectives of um, clerks from uh, not only small towns, but large towns and cities around the state. And so uh, just for committee members to orient themselves, we have a very nice uh, document um, on our committee page under today's date with some names and contact information for some of the clerks who are with us today. Um, and so I will invite Carol to, uh, to give us her introduction or overview. And I don't know if you have a specific order that you uh, had hoped folks would be able to testify, but we would love to hear from each of these clerks, um, their, their uh, observations of the election, and then hopefully we will have an opportunity for committee members to ask questions. So welcome, Carol. Let's get you unmuted. There, there we, we go. go. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for, for inviting us uh, to participate. Um, I, we, it looks like we've got a pretty good turnout of clerks on who were on the invite list, so that's good. We do have uh, many, if not all, of the members of the Municipal Clerk and Treasurer's Association um, uh, Legislative Committee. Um, we also have uh, other clerks. Uh, I did send um, an email out to all clerks in the state um, because I wanted to make sure that we had some clerks that aren't VMCTA uh, members, I want to make sure, even though we represent the majority of clerks in the state, I want to make sure that that all points of view are being uh, represented. Um, also wanted to make sure that we have, as you said, large towns, small towns. Um, we have uh, tabulator towns, non-tabulator towns. Um, so yes, we have a mix. Um, I, I'm not going to read through the, um, the review of 2020 elections that, that I presented that, as you mentioned, is on your, your website, but I will just point out a few things. Uh, I know from what's on your website that the Secretary of State's office has already presented um, there. It looks like Chris Winters presented to you a, a, a nice compilation of the 2020 election seasons and how things went. Um, so uh, I'm not going to rehash a lot of that information. Um, we worked very closely with the Secretary of State's office um, it, starting right after town meeting, which is when the wagon went off the rails and we were all sort of making it up as we went along. Um, so we worked closely on local election information and then primary elections and uh, general elections. Um, working closely with the secretary and also with the, with the legislature, with, with your committee, with the Senate GovOps, um, putting emergency legislation in place. Um, we, the, um, we did the postcard mailings for August, or actually we didn't, the Secretary of State's office did the postcard mailings, when, which went out to all active voters, uh, giving them opportunities to request absentee ballots. Um, that went very well, um, though there were hiccups associated with mailing lists, um, but it did give clerks information that they could use to make uh, some um, changes, corrections, updates to our mailing lists, which was valuable. Um, we took 
the, the advantage of the opportunity to hold primaries in different ways uh, to ensure both election worker and voter safety. Um, we had a broad range of drive through, walk through, curbside, uh, outdoor, um, all kinds of different uh, polling setups uh, based on what different communities had for uh, for their needs and their uh, their facilities and availabilities. Um, it worked really well. Um, we were able to, uh, we did have some challenges associated with tallying write-ins for the primary. Um, what's required by current law for, for uh, tallying write-ins is that you have to uh, look at every ballot. You have to touch every ballot. At least two people have to touch every ballot. Uh, and that certainly was a concern for us during the, the primary and the general, but more for the primary, because for the primary, there are a lot more write-ins um, by virtue of the, the, uh, the fact that there are the three different ballots um, and that the voters really don't understand um, what the primary process is and why they get three ballots and why they're only allowed to vote one of them. Uh, and so we find a lot of crossover where people who, you know, vote the Republican ballot, but then write in their Democratic choices or vice versa. And all of those have to be tallied. Um, we did through the, uh, the directives from the Secretary of State's office, we were able to modify our tallying a bit so that we didn't work in teams of two so that we didn't have to have people right next to each other while tallying. They were able to spread out a bit more um, and swap stacks of ballots off. Um, but it still did require handling all the ballots. Um, and we've talked about doing some changes to the uh, write-in tallying in the past. And perhaps that's something that we'll, we can discuss again this year. Um, ballots for the general election started being bulk mailed by the Secretary of State's office in mid-September, uh, and we immediately started receiving uh, voted ballots back um, and processing them. Um, we also had to mail ballots out ourselves because we had new voters in our communities. We had people move into the community. We had people do changes of address, uh, and we had received their ballots back as undeliverable. So there was a fair amount of uh, mailing out that we had to do ourselves. Um, and so the Secretary of State's office had made, for, made sure that we had um, ballots, envelopes, materials uh, for mailing things out. Um, we did receive hundreds of ballots back as undeliverable. Uh, again, um, the, the checklist is as good as we can maintain it, but of course people move. Uh, in Barry City, about 64% of our housing stock is rentals. So we have a, a very large transient population. Um, and people move around. And so we keep getting, you know, we were getting ballots back. Um, we had about 400 of them that came back as undeliverable. Um, I'm not sure what the solution to that is, but, but certainly as the discussion continues uh, around um, mail ballots, uh, that's something that will need to be talked about. Uh, there were challenges with public feedback. Uh, many people were happy to get the, the ballots mailed directly to them. Many people were not happy to get the ballots mailed directly to them. Um, we fielded phone calls, emails, and social media attacks. Uh, one instance in Barry City, uh, I, one of my voters uh, posted photos on on, on uh, online on her Facebook page that showed that ostensibly showed that she had gotten two ballots for the general election. She had one ballot with her name on it, or one envelope with her name on it, another envelope with her name on it. Um, and, you know, she was claiming that she had gotten uh, two ballots. Um, somebody pointed it out to me, and I looked in my records and said, my guess is that one of those is her August primary ballot, which she never voted. And it turned out that that's what it was. But of course, no correction was ever posted online. So um, it left that perception out there that, that uh, people were getting double ballots. Um, 
We did get great funding support um, from the Secretary of State's office. Obviously, it um, came from the federal government, came from the legislature, uh, allowed towns to install ballot drop boxes, uh, which were very popular with voters. Um, it also covered other extraordinary election expenses. Um, they also uh, provided us with uh, boxes of uh, personal protective equipment um, and hand sanitizer and wipes and, and various supplies like that, which were very useful um, during the elections. Uh, in addition, many clerks also received uh, funding support from an organization called the Center for Tech and Civic Life, whose mission is, according to their website, quote, to harness the promise of technology to modernize the American voter experience, voting experience. Uh, and they made grants of $5,000 to many communities around the state, allowing us to, uh, to get other extraordinary election expenses. In Barry City, it helped pay for um, plexiglass shields between the voting, the election workers and the voters, uh, along with some other supplies. So that was, was very helpful. Um, we were dealing with a record number of absentee ballots, uh, obviously, um, and thankfully, as part of his directives, uh, Secretary Condos uh, allowed clerks who have tabulators to feed ballots into them in advance of the election, um, which was a, a boon to many uh, towns who took advantage of that. Um, the opportunity to process them in advance. Barry City did not, but I, but I certainly have spoken to a lot of clerks who, um, who felt that that was, uh, you know, incredibly valuable to them to be able to process early. Um, election day went very well. Um, I, I, everything I've heard has been uh, positive from across the state. Um, Thankfully, we mostly had significantly reduced numbers of in-person voting, um, which helped control contact uh, between election workers and voters. Uh, I believe in the report from the Secretary of State, uh, they said 98% of precincts had reported by midnight on election night, which you know, makes us the envy of many, many states around the country. Um, we did very well. Uh, there were challenges with the defective ballots, uh, especially during the primary election. Um, as I said, the, the process is complicated uh, and it led to uh, many, uh, a fairly high percentage of, of defective ballots. And, and I've included in my document just some information about um, a few towns and what sort of percentages they had for defective ballots, both for August and for November. And you can see that the, the number is much higher for the August primaries. Um, and so perhaps it's time to take a look at not only how defective ballots are defined and handled, um, but perhaps even talk about how primaries are done. Um, so um, the collaborations really made a, a, a huge difference in, in the success Vermont had. Uh, the legislature, the Secretary of State's office, the post office, clerks, political parties, advocacy groups, election workers and voters, everybody played a part um, in making uh, our season a success. But to me, the most important thing was the flexibility that was afforded to us. There, there were very few things that were mandated. And so much of it was that we all had the options to make the decisions that were the best for our communities. My community didn't pre-process absentee ballots, but others did, you know, into tabulators, but others did. I did drive through voting in August through our field house. Other people did outdoor voting. That's what was best for their communities. And having that flexibility really made a huge difference. And I would recommend that we, that we continue to look at um, whatever changes go into place as being, uh, as enhancing the options that we all have rather than restricting them. This might be a great time to, before we get into suggestions for future elections, to ask other clerks 
um, who may have additional comments they'd like to make. I don't have any particular order uh, unless we just want to go by the order that's on your website, um, which I don't have pulled up yet, but I'm pulling it up. Not right to now. worry. I, um, I will just jump right in and suggest, um, since I would really like to hear from each of you because you represent um, different sized communities from different areas of the state, I would like to give each of you a few minutes to, to give us your observations of um, of what worked, what didn't work. Um, you can contrast the primary to the general election. You can narrow in on um, on uh, checklist issues versus uh, you know drive up balloting issues if if that's what you uh, experienced. And so I'm going to unmute. Uh, well, maybe I'm going to ask Bobby to unmute because I know that she's having a little bit of trouble. Um, with her connection today, but uh, would love to invite Bobby to go first. And then I'm just going to run through alphabetically in my participants list. So um, we'll hopefully get a chance to get to everyone. And Bobby, are you there? Hmm? You're unmuted according to my screen, but I'm not hearing you yet. Maybe your audio on your phone connection will work better. Do you recall how to unmute yourself? All right, so Bobby, we will come back to you. Um, just as soon as you figure out how to get unmuted, let me know and, um, and we will definitely come back because I'd love to hear your thoughts um, and thank you for being here. Um, so Kathy Mander Adams, tell us where you're from and uh, give us your feedback observations on how 2020 elections worked for you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Uh, the the Probably the biggest point I need to make is that the Bel I am from Belvedere. We're a very small town. I have 245 registered voters. And we typically have a pretty good turnout uh, in the past. Some of the things that stand out the most to me is that our older population that's not technically connected um, that just go by uh, past performance, you know, elections and all of that stuff. Um, while they're very aware of COVID and all the restrictions with COVID, the whole process of uh, the first the first card that they received, giving them an option to uh, ask for an absentee ballot for general elections, actually brought more requests for that than I've seen since I've been town clerk. Um, and the same. You know, the same kind of thing occurred uh, for general elections. They were confused by the ballots as they got in the mail, mostly because of the, the age range and the lack of, um, you know, familiarity with all of these changes that have been going on. So I did get a lot of phone calls asking why they were getting this or what did this mean? and. You know, I was happy to answer their questions, but in general, um, I think the Secretary of State's office did a wonderful job keeping us uh, informed. I was never, uh, I never felt alone when I had a question, when I had an issue using the system and asking questions. I was always uh, helped right on the spot, 99% of the time. Uh, it was a great help and, you know, I think moving forward, the general population understands the need for moving forward with um, how things are done, making some changes. It's been a struggle. Uh, town meeting, the town meeting idea has been a struggle, but again, we have to keep moving forward. So I think the changes that were made were not a huge problem for me. I have to tell you, I can't tell you how many times I said, I am so glad I live in such a small town. 
If I know the people, if I don't know them personally, I know them because I, I was here when they moved here and I, I do the recording of the land records and process of tax return, you know, I mean, um, uh, building the property taxes and so forth. So if I had to deal with a large population, I, I, I would need more help. I work alone. So considering the circumstances, I feel as if everything went pretty well for me. Um, I, I never felt like I was going to pull my hair out or be lost in the crowd. And that's a good thing. <laughs> well, I, I can imagine that the logistics on election day can often leave people feeling like they want to pull their hair out. So I feel, I feel very happy to hear you say that. Um, committee, any questions for Kathy before we go on to the next person? All right, I'm gonna jump back to Bobby because we've got a little unstable uh, internet access going on here. So Bobby, share with us your observations on how the 2020 elections worked for you. I, can you hear me? Yes. I think it worked very well in Marshfield. We did outdoor elections for both the primary and the general. Uh, for the primary, since it was warmer, we just had everyone bring their own little, uh, little personal tents and we had people drive like station to station around our parking lot. Um, for the general, since it was colder, we rented a large, uh, like a wedding tent. That worked well. People seemed to be very happy with the ability to stay in their cars. Um, I don't know that we'll be able to do that in April because it was so expensive. We were only able to do it with a grant, but people really appreciated it. We got a lot of thanks. And we got a lot of thanks for mailing the ballots. Uh, we did have some people that did not want to vote that way on a ballot that was mailed to them. And they came to the polls and some of them brought their ballot with them, some didn't. But overall, I think it worked pretty well. Uh, we had the same issues that Carol talked about with the defective ballots from the primary. People either didn't return the two extra ballots or they voted on two ballots they just, they don't understand that they can only vote on one and they have to return the other two, no matter how many instructions we include with a ballot, how many people we talk to. I think there would be a lot less defective ballots if we could just send the one. And then we have the same issue with write-ins. We have, there seems to be a group in town that are trying to make a joke out of write-ins. They, they put, an actual voter's name, but then they give them a little cutesy nickname in between their first and last name. And I think they're just using it to embarrass people. So that's a little frustrating. I, I wish there was some way to combat that. I think if we made people declare their write-in candidacy, we wouldn't have to report those joke names. They seem to be inside jokes because there'll be two or three people that use the same nickname for someone. So that's discouraging. It's not, it's not a serious use of the purpose of a write-in. And we also get write-ins for whatever sports team won. When the Red Sox won the World Series back, I'm sorry that I don't remember the year, we got, we got write-in votes for each player on the team. People are not using the write-in function seriously. So it's, it feels like a big waste of our time. And especially during COVID when it means close contact. Well, that's frustrating. <laughs> um, committee, yeah. any questions for Bobby about, um, about their experience in Marshfield during the primary or the general election? All right. Well. Thank you, Bobby. I appreciate you being here with us, and and um, and you're the the first to say you did uh, primarily um, drive through voting. So I'm I'm uh, curious to to imagine how that worked. So thank you for describing that to us. Uh, Curry Galloway, who is the St. Albans City Clerk, tell us how how were elections in St. Albans in 2020. 
Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and be here today. Um, we met a lot of the challenges in the 2020 election year really well with not only a lot of new voters, but a lot of support from election workers. I thought it, we had an influx and I think a lot of clerks had an influx of people wanting to help out during the election and for pre-ballot processing. And it was great that we were able to have people outside of our municipality to help us do that. Um, I almost probably didn't need to, but still I think that's a really great addition if they're Vermont resident to be able to assist during elections. Um, the primary was kind of a trial run as far as the COVID friendly layout. Um, you know, I had to even design, you know, almost like a CAD presentation, but it was on a PowerPoint. Um, just the, just so we would know just exactly what type of voter we could assist best, you know, if they weren't able to wear a mask or didn't want to wear one, we had to actually come up with an entirely new process. And it was really excellent to have um, kind of support and language backing from the Department of Health there. Um, you know, so going forward, you know, no matter how less this virus gets, I think it's always great to keep health concerns in mind, you know, for all elections, all public gatherings in general. But um, I think health concerns are really um, important to constantly, you know, touch on, at least in some capacity. Um, so we did uh, a lot of, uh, the postcards were great. We did receive a lot of them back um, with requests on them. People were able to sign them. Very few people didn't. So, um, but we did receive a lot of undeliverable ballots during, you know, the general election with 72% of people voting by mail during St. Albans City's general election. Um, our defective ballot rate was really low. Um, we had about 1% for the general, but you know, those are obviously lower than the primaries. Um, you know, that said, for any thoughts that you all may have for, you know, discussing curing ballots, you know, I echo what Carol wrote in her report about, you know, really fine tuning that pr procedure um, for, you know, the burden or liability of, you know, municipal officials to contact voters and how that goes. So um, I think that another big piece and I think other clerks were mentioning it is, you know, it was a real opportunity to educate voters. Like I said, we had a lot of new ones. Our local paper, St. Albans Messenger, um, did several installments of like how to do your mail-in ballot, um, you know, with video and uh, in the newspaper. So I thought that was really helpful for people, um, you know, especially for, you know, kind of complicated elections like the primary. Um, I'm really a proponent for the universal mailing. I think it's excellent, but I'm really glad that it was left to the municipalities uh, to make that decision for this upcoming town meeting day. Um, and having that flexibility to move the date, I think is crucial um, to do a kind of a, a complex procedure like mailing ballots um, to give them that leeway. Um, and, you know, honestly, like I said, we had a lot of absentee requests and absentee returns. So that processing time was crucial and it worked beautifully. You know, we had a 0% error rate. We were able to collaborate safely and, you know, have processes in place. I was able to schedule those for that entire 30 days. Um, and I think that was fantastic. Um, and it made the election day, you know, seem, you know, no worries there. You know, you know that you, everything is processed. You have the, um, the log that the secretary of state supplied. So, you know, um, you know, which number you left off at. Um, and I thought that was great. And we saw a lot of overseas ballots and, you know, the work with overseas has been really good. So I don't know if there's any improvements there, but, you know, there's still a lot of interest from people voting overseas. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I echo what people say about write-ins. You know, I think I had, I don't know, a 20 page election report um, for mine, you know, I wrote down every single person, you know, so even if they had one vote, you know, I, so it kind of does add up. And again, you know, with safety, you know, we did have teams of two, but I think the write-ins, it's, it's always good to review that no matter what, you know, we all kind of go through it. And I think it's very valid for people to be able to be free to be on these ballots. But I also think a little procedure um, and some outline for that, I think would be a really good thing too, because um, I try to assist candidates as much as I can with giving them information, um, sending them the forms and everything they need to, you know, run efficiently. And I think that's a really good, um, you know, role for the clerk. 
um, to do that. I know they need to do their homework, but I think that you know we would be more than willing to um, assist people um, with letting new people know like, hey, if this is how you want to declare, this is how you do it and here's all the information. And I'm sure the Secretary of State would be you know, on board too, but um, that's really, I think we had some successful elections. It wasn't as stressful as I thought it would be. I think a lot of people learned a lot and the clerks, I, the clerks and the elections division, incredible. I, I don't know that I could do without it. I'm a fairly new clerk. So um, having my first presidential election be during, you know, a global pandemic, this team is incredible. So thank you to them. And thank you to you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for that report. Um, and uh, we have heard We've heard mostly universal praise for the Secretary of State's office and the support that they give to uh, to clerks while administering elections. So glad to hear you say that. Um, committee members, any questions? All right, I don't see committee members diving in. So I'm gonna to go to Donna Kinville next. Hi, uh, again, thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to us. Um, it's, it's always great for, for us who go through this to, to know that someone cares and understands what we're going through. Um, South Burlington was a little bit different. Uh, we kind of stayed in line with our elections. We actually had a failed school budget vote. So because of the directive, the school board was able to postpone their second revote a little bit. So we were probably one of the first um, municipalities to actually hold an election in the COVID area era we did at the end of May. Um, and for the most part, we stayed the line. You know, we mailed out ballots to everybody who wanted them. We had all our polling locations open. Um, it did involve a lot of thought about how do I keep my workers and my my um, my voters safe. So it was a re-whole configuration of all the polling areas in one door, out another door, how do you move this and that. So there was a lot of confusion <laughs> on their voters. Once they got in the polling location, they're like, where do I go now? Um, so we even had arrows on the floor, but they just couldn't get used to the, the different layout than they're, than they're used to. Um, so, but that actually went well. We had um, about 2,500 people vote in May in, at the polls, which we thought was, was pretty good. Um, we had about another 3,000-ish um, vote by early voting. Um, so it was, a, it was a good turnout. It failed again. Um, and then so it got moved to the August primary. And so that just made it, it, it crazy. I think the August election for me was the worst election of all of them because we were mailing out ballots to people when they requested them. We're getting their postcards and they've changed it. It, it was just mass information coming into us at one time. Um, and at that point, Curry, I was pulling my hair out. Um, just trying to get through all of that. Um, but we did, and we actually did get a lot of good information out of that. And we're still using that information to try and figure out and, and challenge people, um, you know, question whether or not they really are residents of our town. Um, we had about 2,000 ballots that were returned as undeliverable for the November election. So we we're working off of those. Um, one thing which, which the Secretary of State's office did, and, and, I, and we hugged this thing. They sent some larger towns a letter opener, electric letter opener. It was the best invention we ever could have had. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kurt. Um, I mean, we wanted to hug this thing at the end of the day. We put the things in and they went, what would have taken an hour for people to open these envelopes took a matter of a minute or two. So it's, it's good to find different ways to, um, do our jobs, but do it much more efficiently. And then that's what that Center for Tech group um, was trying to do and, and trying to find ways to help the election progress. And, and I actually went down to Montpel um, to Washington and Georgette did as well and met with them. And they are truly a bipartisan group who are interested in the administration of elections. That's it. Um, and they gave us a real broad base of what we want to use our election money for. I bought my printer because we have such a large volume of mail out ballots, early ballots. Um, my, my, my printer couldn't handle it. You know, you're doing three, 400 a, a day and you've got three envelopes you're feeding through the printer, it, it, it couldn't handle it. So I bought myself an industrial size printer, which would be solely designated for um, absentee ballots. Um, 
one thing that did save us um, was being able to early process the ballots. Uh, even prior to 2020, processing of early ballots is getting to be an issue. Um, to, to be able to handle them at the polls is going to be an issue. The day before an election, you are out the door with people who are coming at the last minute to vote. You really don't have time to, to do the early processing, which the law currently allows us to do just that day before. So it really needs to get extended a little bit farther out um, if we can. Um, as Carol did said, I did get requests or people complaining about double ballots. And a lot of that is the VEMS, our, our election software. If I were to register, and I'm an old time South Burlington resident and I register Donna um, S. Kenville, which is, is fine. If I went do and I did a nickname of, you know, Dawn Kinville in that same birth date and everything, the system will not match me. So it will create a new voter file. And that is something that we've been working with Secretary of State's office for them to broaden, 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 make larger <laughs> our search features. So if I enter that in with that my date of birth, it's going to show me everybody in the state that has that same date of birth. Because um, people were getting two ballots. That, that was a, a concern. Um, the one thing I had an issue with, and I don't know if anybody else had, is I had an issue, I did have an issue with my tabulators. I didn't have an issue with them counting, they're right on. But they're getting old, they're getting clanky, they're getting noisy, people put them in and they like freak. And then they start to grab their ballot because they're not sure what's happening. I had two of my machines where the people grabbed their ballot and it tore the ballot in the machine. Now you can't get the ballot out of the machine. So I had to turn that machine off, take the tabulator, have the voter watch, say, what is the count here that says number of ballots processed? Take the card out, put it into a new machine. Now what is, you agree it's the same total? They're like, yes, okay, now we continue on. Um, so the machines are getting old um, and they are going to eventually need some type of uh, major rehaul. And they're probably, I would say 18 years old that we've had these machines. Um, so this, this is one of the things I've had, um, about the primary, um, requesting the three ballots. It's really kind of funny because people were almost like we're making them do two different things for the presidential primary. You have to tell us which ballot you want for the state primary. You have to you give them all three. And so each time you're, you're constantly just educating them on the difference and it's almost like if it's just one, it would be just so much easier. They know when a primary is, they request their ballot and they're done. Um, it would be less questions on that way. Um, I'm just trying to think. Then the biggest thing we had was um, just the national news. People, oh, but I, you, you got my envelope yet, but can you guarantee my signature matched? No, we can't guarantee that we don't do that. And so it's just a lot of national news, um, which this year seemed to really filter into the local issues. And people were really, really, really concerned about their ballot being counted. Um, and so we got that, which is not something we really got much of before. Um, so I, I think that's kind of pretty much. Oh, one thing I, I have when I have my BCA meeting before this next election, um, I'm going to ask, this is a question I ask a lot of people, what did you learn from the COVID, from all of this pandemic that you learned that needed to be changed that you're gonna continue on in the next election? So I'm gonna put that out to my election and say, what did we learn? Was the one way direction, was that really good? Or did it cause problems? And, and just kind of look at all of this as a great time to revamp the way we do things. Um, so that's a, that's a challenge I'm gonna put out to my, my board. That's a great idea, um, and I, I look forward to, to hearing what, what your board says uh, in response to that question. I'm sure each of our communities would have a different set of responses. So thank you so much, Donna. Um, and Peter Anthony has a question for you. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter Anthony from Barry City. What, um, in regards to the primary, what was the principal um, reason uh, for the size of defective ballots that you experienced? And did you experience an unusually large number this past cycle? Um, I don't think, as a percentage wise, I don't think we did an, um, a big difference percentage. 
I think total wise, because there are so many ballots out there that the number seems higher, if you count the ballots, um, it had to do with the number of ballots mostly. I mean, people are gonna forget to sign the certificate envelope. Those are always just, that's usually the most on any election. But when you throw the, the ballots in there at the three ballots, it was either they included more than one in their certificate envelope, they didn't return the two, or they voted more than one and they put them all in the certificate envelope so you couldn't count any of them. Thank you. Um, yes, voter education, as much as we tried, <laughs> it, it didn't seem to take. Um, so we've had a couple of our larger communities and now we're gonna come back close to my home and uh, talk to Georgette Wolf Ludwig, who's our Fairley town clerk and welcome Georgette. It's nice to see you in a little Zoom box. <laughs> It's so nice to see you and thank you to you and everyone for inviting me to attend this. It's been great listening to all the clerks and of course a lot of the issues that I had have been covered by a lot of the, the clerks. I have to say um, one of the helpful things about the August primary was when the Secretary of State's office did the postcard. I was able to really take a good look at my checklist and change addresses, get corrections made. Um, which was really good. I figured people who were who had actually left town. And so I could really create a good active voter checklist. I felt we have about 750 on our checklist, but about 60 of them are folks that, you know, I don't know, they're, are they in town? Or are they out of town? And you can't just take them off if they don't respond to a challenge letter. So it was really good feeling to get a real good idea of what the active list was. So that was really helpful. Um, with defective was mostly for the uh, August primary, same thing that everybody is talking about. Um, the, the voter not understanding the process, putting ballots, more extra voted ballots in their certificate envelope. Um, but we did see participation up in the primary. It was the most I'd ever had in Fairly to participate in a primary. Uh, so I think sending out, sending out that card and giving people the option, um, put it right there um, in front of them and they, and they did vote. I think more people voted. I think the whole state, right? Wasn't it one of the things that more people voted in the whole state? So, um, the general election, I would say, went smoothly. Of course, we were all more concerned about COVID at that time, and and uh, but the Center for Tech and Civic Life, the the grant that they gave Town of Fairley for five thousand dollars really helped. I was able to buy more PPE with plexiglasses, plexiglass, and and signage. Signage was uh, wonderful for curbside, for in in the building to keep people six feet separated. So. That was a huge, huge help. Um, voter participation was huge. And thank goodness, uh, most people voted by absentee early ballot. We had a few folks that were concerned. Um, I think it had a lot to do with the media. And, um, but the drop box that we were able to purchase with Secretary of State, the funds that they gave us really helped when I talked with my voters that I will get your ballot, I will pick it up, you know, it will come here, it will get voted to, to reassure them it was really helpful. Um, I'm trying to think, oh, I got an electric letter opener too, Donna. <laughs> Even though I only had to open some odd, like 400 some odd, that was truly helpful. So definitely um, trying to get as many tools as possible, signage uh, to help, you know, uh, the voters. We unfortunately didn't get anybody to use the, um, Oh gosh, the democracy, you know, the voters for people that have um, disabilities. We can't seem to get anybody to, to use that. It's too bad because it, I actually used it because I thought, well, I'd like to get someone to use it. And um, it works really well. It was also nice to have it knowing that if we ran out of ballots, we were able to use that machine and it would print a ballot. So um, um, unfortunately that's just really not being utilized, I think, as much as it could be. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else. I had a little bit of an issue with poll workers in the sense that 
um, some people came forward, but others were very concerned. And um, especially because my, my poll workers are primarily uh, retired and of that age. And so I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned about town meeting because we are going from a floor meeting to Australian balloting and I'm getting more resistance uh, to work the polls uh, just as the pandemic seems to get worse and we don't have our back vaccines yet so that'll be interesting but all in all it was a it was a great election I love elections I thought things worked really well and I missed seeing the people but we we got the job done so that was good thanks Georgette mm -hmm. uh, committee members any questions for Georgette on how the elections went in fairly all right I think next up would be John Odom so we're back to a city clerk from our fair capital city. John, how were 2020 elections for the city of Montpelier? Well, things went, I mean, generally speaking, they went, they went quite well. Um, we, I would echo, echo a few things and that's probably mainly what I'll, what I'll do for you because I think we all had similar experiences and probably have similar recommendations. Uh, SOS was great. They were terrific for us uh, and in regards to the Center for Tech and Civic Life, they're, um, they're a great resource. I hope if you all start looking at, maybe looking into some of the procedures and stuff in other states that might be comparable, they'd be a great resource. It's a, I've worked with them in the past. They're, they're a small, nimble operation, very smart, uh, and they could have, a, they could have a, potentially a lot to contribute. Um, as far as the, um, the primary went, Echoing everything everybody says, you know, we had a little more front end work with that because the, in the general, the Secretary of State sent everything out. But we, um, I would be another voice in favor of, you know, I have a lot more conversations with people about how does this three ballot, two envelope thing work than I, than I have with people who don't like or resent or don't understand having to declare a primary ballot that they want to take in the presidential primary. That's, that's way off. I think people are past that hump and that would be, you know, certainly save a lot of paper and a lot of grief and, and, and help with that uh, voter participation. Uh, so we did have a lot of improvements on our lists. Um, didn't quite, wasn't quite as many as I'd hoped in the general. We had a lot more bounces. Now we locally did have a little bit of challenge with our post office that I think other folks didn't, but, um, I would suggest you all think about empowering the Secretary of State to have a little more flexibility with how they approach list enhancement and list hygiene. I don't want anybody changing my lists, but there's ways you can do national change of address that could be helpful without, you know, updating list addresses without authorization from the, from the clerks or the, the BCAs. You could, for example, identify the folks who have a change of address that is outside of the town now. And those could potentially be, uh, go into a, a, ch a challenge list. You could also run lists through to check the, or the addresses to check for deliverability. Um, that could help us a lot. And that's something that could be taken out. So both of those things I think would help us a lot. Um, Got to lock in that early processing. I don't know how we would have done it without it. Um, and, you know, I would just, moving forward, um, I would put even more stock than sort of this conversation of how did the primary and how did the general go. Um, I'd look very closely at how town meeting goes, especially with those towns that um, are gonna, you know, do the, the all mail in again, which is what we're doing. Um, that's gonna be more telling if every, you know, we were in all new territory for the, August, we were then in all new territory for the general. Now we're in all new territory again. And town meeting day introduces enough complexities that I think whatever we can learn from that will be enough to trickle down, I think, and impact the others. And as far as that goes, you all need to really think about changing those filing deadlines uh, to do a mail-in election. They are too tight. There's no margin for error. You know, we have to to compress all that work that we did into a very narrow time frame, so there's, I'm, I'm terrified of it. Honestly, I'm not sure how it's going to go, but we're going to do our best. But 
but that that really has to be done. We need to be thinking in terms of running these elections um, in a more sustainable way, volunteer wise. I know we did. I think a lot of people, a lot of our reports on how well things went really depended on a flood of volunteers that we received. That flood is very unusual. And uh, we're going to see that flood go away for town meeting day. And that again will give us a better sense than looking back at that one even more informatively than the other. Also, if we, for those of us who are doing the mail, all mail in, um, historically, uh, you don't see turnout when, you know, looking at Oregon, Washington, Utah, folks that have been doing this for a while. Uh, the general elections did not go up in terms of participation nearly as much as people thought they did. But the lower turnout elections, the, you know, like the statewide primary, like the municipal elections, they went boom, right up to that general level. So we'll also all be looking at turnout to those of us who are doing the all mail in, I guess. Again, we're all going to be looking at unprecedented turnout that might only compare to a couple of these presidential primaries, but it could be higher than that. So all of this means you all are going to have to be really nimble, I think, on whatever you all work on, because you're going to get a lot more granular information, I think, come town meeting day, even. So that's, um, um, yeah, that's probably all I got. Thank you, John. Um, committee members, any questions for John with regard to how Montpelier's election season went? All right. I am not seeing any hands. So uh, Tim Arsenault, thank you for being with us and uh, tell us how things went down in Vernon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, firstly, I'm both the clerk and uh, town moderator in Vernon and a longtime broadcaster based in Brattleboro. So really I am used to a uh, sense of panic, but uh, this election was the perfect storm because not only were we dealing with COVID, which brought on a high level of land record and property transfers, the election itself. But we also took advantage of the land records grants being offered by the tax department and put our land records online this season. So with just one and a half people in this office, that meant that we were, were stepping and fetching. Uh, we did get a lot of confusion on absentee ballots to the point where some people were asking via social media, where's your drop box? I took a picture of it, I put a big sandwich board sign and says, this is it. And then they couldn't fill out the absentee ballot. So I did a YouTube video on how to fill out an absentee ballot. And uh, that began to get some traction as the election went. Uh, we did our primary outside. Thankfully, I had the help of our emergency management director who is a, a retired Brattleboro fire chief. And he was very, very helpful in uh, making sure that we were all properly socially distanced. We did our uh, November election in the usual place downstairs in the town hall with social distancing, masks and all the like. And he uh, was able to stop a couple who decided that they weren't gonna wear masks for anything, anyhow, anyway. So we uh, quickly brought a couple of ballots outside and make sure that they were taken care of before they went away. Um, voter education really is a key here because we had a, all-time high level of absentee ballots come in for the general election and an all-time raw number of voters vote in November. But it seemed to me that there were some people who wanted no part of an absentee ballot, they threw it away, and others just had no clue about how to deal with it, even trying to use a magic marker to fill it out. And of course, that bled to the other side. And thankfully, they called us and uh, we met them at the door with another ballot so they could correct their mistake. But uh, still, I, I think we got through it okay. Some days I don't know how, and both the clerk association and the secretary of state's office talked me down from the cliff several times during this process. So uh, in the end, we, we did fine, but, but it was a struggle at times. Well, Tim, given your double role, I wish you luck for town meeting day. <laughs> uh, our select board already has uh, tentatively agreed to push back the actual um, floor meeting. We'll do our, uh, our Australian ballot vote on the traditional day, but 
we are looking at mid-May for an actual floor meeting outside. And I think that may suit our purpose. Excellent. Any questions from committee members for Tim about their experience? All right, I think that each of the clerks who's with us has had a chance to speak now. And so I just wanna open it up to a few, um, a few more general questions. Um, and not all of you talked about this, but I'm wondering if it was universally um, a challenge to find poll workers, given that many of our poll workers are, uh, are of the retirement age. Um, so, uh, Clerks, if you want to weigh in on this, uh, feel free to give me a wave. And I'll just call on people as I see them wave, or you can raise your little blue hand. Kathy, did you uh, did you have a, a challenge with poll workers? I did. Um, we pay our assistant election officials a pretty good fee, which has helped us in the past to get all the necessary help. But I struggled this time. Um, right up until elections, you know, I was still looking for people, willing because, regardless of how many absentee ballots were turned in, we still had to be open. We we had some of the same issues that you heard from all the other town clerks, uh, from refusing to wear a mask to, um, you know, bringing their their ballots in. So it was educating my assistant poll, my poll workers, assisting them. I actually brought them to the office the day before elections and showed them the setup and the process and the six foot distancing and their role and how to help people who come to the door. I actually had a, a assistant working outside the door because I only had one entrance and one exit. So I had to traffic, you know, so it was hot on uh, primary, so the biggest complaint was, you know, the, the heat that we had to deal with. Um, but basically, I have a few people who said sure, uh, and I provided them with all of the protection equipment. It was provided to me, so it was a great, you know, it was a, no expense to me. But a couple of them wanted everything. They wanted the face mask and the shield and the gloves and the cleaner and the, you know, the pens and everything where some of my typical usual helpers said, nope, I'm not coming anywhere near a, a, a voting presence. So COVID was definitely an issue, definitely an issue. Money couldn't bring some people here. So, and, and the proper gear couldn't, couldn't bring some of them here either. So I had, to, I had to really figure out a way to make it work and not have any one person work 14 hours. Except you. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Bobby. What do you? Uh, what are your observations on poll workers? Initially, when we were talking about doing the November election inside, most of my JPs said that they wouldn't be able to work. They're all of an age that puts them at a higher risk. But I was pleasantly surprised at the number of new people who volunteered. We don't pay our election workers. We've never had to, we've always had volunteers, but we had a lot of new volunteers. And then when we decided that we could, when we got the grant and we could afford to do a big tent outside, some of my JPs also came, but they were scared. But it, it was nice to see some new faces also. I don't know what town meeting will bring because we're probably gonna have to do it inside. Mm -hmm. John Odom. So a little different experience. We were flooded with volunteers. Um, I had to turn them away, you know, both on election day and lead days leading up to election day where we had the more flexibility to, to do more with the polls. A volunteer management actually became a big time suck for me. So it was a very, I'm sure there's no question to me, you know, I usually have to go out and find people and shake the bushes or really harass my BCA, which can be hard to do. So this experience I know was unique. Um, so this will be different in the future, I'm sure. But for this time around, boy, did it make my life easier. Well, that's excellent. 
Bob Hooper has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. While Mr. Odom is warmed up there, can he expand a little bit on the comment he made about the post office issue? And I'd be interested to know if having just received a Christmas card last week mailed from Pennsylvania uh, the day before Christmas, I'm wondering if anybody else had mail problems that are significant. The mail problems uh, were significant. I don't want to uh, diminish the incredible improvements we were able to make from the postcard experience in August. Um, that was just tremendous. But still, we were unpleasantly surprised by how many came back. Um, so thinking uh, it's, it's a tricky conversation to have because, you know, we can't just go change addresses ourselves. We can't just put in an NCOA run and update everybody's addresses. But we can, I think there are opportunities and those are just a couple off the top of my head to you know, empower, especially at the global level here, the Secretary of State, where, which really contains all of our lists. We just have individual queries into that list. But there are, I think, creative ways to use those list enhancements that don't cross that line. Uh, I think, well, I mentioned the two that came to my head, run, a, run an NCOA and don't touch any of the addresses, but tag the ones who indicate they have moved is for us to challenge them. Uh, you can run it through a list to see if the addresses we have are considered deliverable. And uh, sometimes some vendors, I believe, can sort of fix that. So you're not changing the address. You're just straightening it up so it can be deliverable. And then tagging those ones for us that may not be deliverable. So we're not wasting uh, postage going out there. And it gives us, as clerk, something to work on, uh, something to, to fix. So, I mean, those are just the, the couple at the top of my head. But that's going to be a big deal because I think we got a lot of, at least, you know, I, I live in a very supportive community for the mail-in elections. Uh, so this may not quite indicate for everybody, but at least in, in my community, um, I got a lot of leeway on problematic addresses, on people occasionally getting two because they were at a place under two different names or similar names. Um, I'm not going to continue to get that leeway from them. Um, so it, it needs to get better. And obviously most of that comes on to me. But um, there are ways, I think, some creative use of some of these services that are out there could, um, could help it to be done on the global level. So you're basically talking about administrative type stuff rather than the actual ballots getting out, ballots getting back. Yeah, well, I'm talking about where we send the ballots to and how we make sure they get there. Um, getting them back and processing. Um, there's not a whole lot of creative ways to do that besides getting the, uh, you know, the letter, the envelope opener, <laughs> where we just sort of have to do that. I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, getting them out um, obviously is also a bigger deal on town meeting day because we're doing it ourselves and the Secretary of State isn't. Um, so, yeah, that end of it, there seems to be a lot less, a lot less wiggle room for how we do it. But the efficiency of doing it. I think there's a lot of room to have conversations about. Thanks, John. I'll go back to Bobby and then Donna. Hi, we, we had a lot of issues, more so in August than in November with the Postal Service. I don't, I didn't bring it up before because I don't know that this committee can solve the issue, but we had a pile of postcards come back undeliverable, which is great if the person's moved, but when it's, you know, we're a small town, I know a lot of these people, they hadn't moved. There was no reason why the card was returned. It was just a mistake, a flat out mistake of the postal service. It's happened with my personal mail. It's, it's a pr real procedural problem in our local post office. It's, it's not Marchfield, it's Plainfield, half of our town has a Plainfield zip code. And for whatever reason, they just didn't deliver those postcards. They returned them undeliverable, but the, the, they were addressed properly. It wasn't a formatting issue. It wasn't a coding issue. They just returned them. And if I hadn't known a lot of these voters, I would have 
you know, challenged them, not sent them a general ballot, but I just, some of the names struck me as people that are still around. So I started, that was a huge time suck for me because I had to call all of these people and we don't have phone numbers. So I had to track them down however I could, you know, call the neighbor and whatever and find out why why the post office was returning their ballots and they could never give me a reason. But some of them were absentee ballots they had actually requested and then we had to figure out how to get their ballot to them. That was difficult. That sounds um, frustrating and I hope that you have described your issue to the Secretary of State's office because I know in testimony with them last week, um, they spent a lot of time on the phone with folks at the US Postal Service and um, it would be nice to know why that was happening. I Will had given me, Will Sending had given me the contact information for the person that was sort of overseeing the absentee ballot process for the postal service. And I did communicate with her about a lot of that. I also had some ballots returned undeliverable that were not Marshfield ballots, but the people, the voters had Marshfield mailing addresses. And I think that was just a case of our local post office seeing the red envelope and assuming it was mine. Mm. That's more understandable, but the, the unreturnable, you know, void, you know, return to sender address the unknown cards. I, I don't know what to do about that. No. Donna had a hand up before. Um, just a quick one. I'm more like John where I got so many requests for, for um, poll workers. It was, it was unmanageable, um, which is a great issue to have, except for those people who think they were alienated against, but we, we tried to use everybody we got. But the issue that that came with, and we have four polling locations in the city, I can't be at all four polling locations at once. So we may have had one trained election worker there and the six or seven brand new people. So that in itself, even though we had pre-training, we did a Zoom meeting, went through all everything, asked questions and all that, um, it was still very nerve wracking on election day. Just like, oh my God, please just let that person I have there being that one person really be on their game today. Um, so we had a lot, like I said, we've got a lot of people that requested it. We just don't have a lot of experienced people, but maybe hopefully we'll get some. Excellent. Uh, Tim. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just uh, one thing to point out, I did have some uh, first time voters also decide to be volunteers after more than half of our, our normal volunteers decided they could not because of COVID concerns. In fact, in one case, there was a gentleman who was claiming the election system was broken. I basically said, put up or shut up, come volunteer. And I won him over as a brand new volunteer. That's, that's excellent. <laughs> um, anyone else wanna weigh in on um, poll workers? I have another question that I would love to throw out to the group, but wanna make sure anyone else, Kathy. I just wanted to quickly add on a, a concern about the Postal Service, because like the others, I was taken by surprise in August by the fact that one of our um, centers that, that sorts mail was closed. So it, it dumped so much of the problem on one sorting center and in our post office to sort out the mess, you know. I, I sent something to somebody, it took them two weeks and she lives a half a mile down the road. So I, I'm not blaming my post office. I'm blaming the, you know, I'm upset about the way in which the whole thing was handled, you know, the, the sorting centers. Yeah. Um, okay, so that leads me to another question that I wanted to ask, and that is um, in the sort of myriad of suggestions that have been made about how to improve on, on this election, now that we have um, uh, such a, a good experience with uh, voting by mail, how many of you um, received ballots after election day? 
in the mail and to what extent was that a challenge um you know just in terms of was it one was it 10 was it 40 um and what is i guess in your opinion what is a fair window to say uh if the ballot was postmarked we ought to count it up to what day and so i saw carol's hand first so go right ahead carol okay um i certainly received a few if i i could look but i would guess that it was five or less um and personally i I'm, have real reservations about the idea of uh, expanding uh, an acceptance date um, beyond election day due to postcard uh, postmark, because you'd be surprised how many pieces of mail we get on a daily basis that have no postmark. And so I, I would be concerned um, about uh, how that would, how that would sugar out, you know, how do I talk to a voter who says, no, but I mailed it. And I say, yeah, but it doesn't have a postmark, but another voters does. Um, this year, it would have been an impossibility because they all, the ones that were all mailed out by the Secretary of State's office, they all had a return postmark from September <laughs> because they had all had postage paid envelopes. Um, so that would be something that would would have to be um, would have to be addressed. Uh, but I really I, I would have a, a hard time thinking that how we could put a, a process in place that would assure that every piece of mail coming in has a legible postmark. Thanks, Carol. Bobby. I, I would like to echo what Carol says. I would be strongly opposed to this. We've had so many issues with postmarks on tax bills being illegible, not being postmarked at all, or being run through an office postage meter, which as you know, you can just change the date and put your own, pick your own date to put on it. And I, I think it, it's, it's a tough road to go down because there are so many different scenarios what do you do with one that looks like it might be november 3rd but it could also be november 8th and you've really you received it on november 12th what do you do if it's illegible what do you do if it's absent what do you do if it's not a hand canceled mark but not a po u.s post office mark but a postage meter from someone's office then what do you do and i think it you know looking at the national news i think that is where a lot of the inconsistency comes from and a lot of the voters lose faith in the system when they see totals changing the next day and the next day and the next day. I, I think that it's not a road we need to go down. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, John Odom, how many ballots did you receive after election day and what's your thought on um, counting those? Very, very few. Um, I was really surprised, fewer than usual. Um, and because of that, it's funny. I have a sort of a very different thinking process, I think, than, than the other clerks on this, but I end up in the same place for a completely different reason. Um, you know, we do manage tax bills, utility bills, um, but, you know, with the postmark. It does go fine. Sure, there are some exceptions to the rule where we have issues, but in general, it's something we do and it's not a big deal. And I do have great concerns over, you know, two voters who mail out their ballots a week before, one of them gets there in time, one of them doesn't. That, that voter being able to say, hey, look, I did everything, you know, I did my due diligence, I did everything right, just like this person, but my vote doesn't count. So I worry about that theoretically, but then the reality was we had fewer come after the election than, uh, than we ever have before. I mean, few enough that it's, it's probably comparable, um, maybe even better um, in some cases than the complaints or the issues we might have with charting those, those um, you know, postmarks that you know, come in for our taxes 
for our, our, our utility bills. So, you know, I come down to, you, you know, you, you want to, you don't want a solution without a problem. Right now, it, it, it ain't broke. So I wouldn't fix it. But I, you know, I would keep that just as a matter of principle in the back of your all's minds, you know, as we go forward over the years. But Right now, all that sort of theoretical stuff notwithstanding, it, it really wasn't an issue. Everybody got stuff in. Thanks, John. Georgette, did you have your hand up? Um, I have to agree with Carol and Bobby um, and John, you know, hit the outcome of it. I, I, it's not broken right now, it works. It's nice to know at 7 p.m. that's it, the ballots are in, we're done, we count those ballots. Um, we can get our results into the Secretary of State's office in a timely manner. And uh, I had to come back, you know, and I always tell people that if you don't trust the mail, because we had issues in Fairly as well, is please use the Dropbox. And so that was utilized more than ever. Um, and so anyway, I, I think it should stay the same. Donna, ballots after Election Day? Um, five or six. Not, not many. One thing we have noticed is Wednesday, the day after is when we get the most. Um, and I think that's just because I don't know why. I mean, these are first class postage. On a week to week basis, Tuesday, we always get the least amount of mail in our, in our city uh, delivered to us than any other day of the week consistently. So I don't know if it's the sorting of the US Post Service that they don't do as much first class on that Tuesday. Um, but I, I'm with everybody else. It's, it's not a big problem. Those four, five or six people, you know, I don't think it's worth changing the system for them. Because um, most of them were mailed the day before. If you look at the stamp, you know, they knew it was going to be late. Um, but um, I would, I would instead more focus on if we can try and get the post till service to say, why aren't you processing these things on Monday night? Why aren't they being processed Tuesday? instead of Wednesday. Yeah, uh, Peter Anthony has a question. I was gonna say, Carol can tell you or confirm what you suspected, namely that for some reason, Tuesday is treated differently. I think uh, Carol can speak to this, but I think the local Barry post office went out of their way on that particular Tuesday to make sure we got what came in. But Tuesday, for some reason, is a, is a non-sort day. It's true. We've, we've been told that by our local postmaster that they don't sort on Tuesdays and we don't get, you know, we may get a flyer or two, but, but we get virtually no mail on Tuesdays. They did go out of their way to make sure that um, ballots were put in our post office box on Tuesday, um, ones that came in on Monday. Uh, so, so they were helpful in that regard, but, um, but they, as a general rule, they don't sort mail on Tuesdays. Bobby, your hand is up. Anything else on this topic? All right. The last question that I wanted to ask, um, did you all use, uh, secure drop boxes and do you, uh, do you hope and intend to use them in future elections? Seeing some thumbs up. Anybody want to speak about that? The volume that came in that way, Tim? Uh, a large volume came in in our town and we did not use a traditional box, uh, drop box instead. Our secure box was a converted toolbox uh, done up by a local contractor who later on in the year became our brand new fire chief. So he did all the metal work, did the uh, bolting to a uh, outside railing and uh, we, we tried to go as low cost as possible on it and it seemed to work. Excellent. Uh, Curry. Thank you. St. Albans City has always had a drop slot um, and we expanded the inside size of it in a temporary um, makeshift but secure drop box. Um, and that was very helpful um, as someone mentioned um, that having the ability to drop it off if people were really not trustworthy or for whatever reason did not wanna mail their ballot or didn't have time to, I think was a great option. 
Um, one thing I forgot to mention in my overview is, you know, I mean, at the base of everything, funding is so important and there was funding available for these drop boxes. But as we continue to learn from all of these elections, it would be nice if we could have the ability to have some funding for things like drop boxes, um, mail machines, mail cutting machines. So um, just those little details are still prevalent and sometimes municipalities may be struggling to make those updates when they know that those would be a good, good addition for their elections. Thanks, Bobby. I agree with, with what Curry said. We had a small drop box. It was, was never adequate for absentee voting, especially with the number that we had this year. So we took advantage of the funding and bought a traditional through the wall mail slot and a gun cabinet and mounted the gun cabinet to the inside wall and the mail ballots go right into the cabinet. It's locked, it's secure and people loved it. And we're still using it now with COVID because our office is locked. People are using it for dog licenses and tax payments and everything. All right, toolbox gun cabinet. Georgette, what do you have? <laughs> yes, there's some great solutions. So um, Fairley has had the same small drop box at the, to the right of the town hall up the stairs by the front door. Um, since I started here in 1990, and it was held together with duct tape uh, the last few years. So certainly wasn't uh, secure. And um, the other thing that I realized it, it wasn't ADA compliant, which I had never, it never had really occurred to me that, um, cause it had just always been there and we had always used it. So with the funding from the Secretary of State's office, I was able to purchase and have installed a real secure lockbox uh, right down by the road so people can actually drive up and drop their ballots off. And um, it really helped having that, especially for the November election as people were concerned about ballots coming in the mail to me, were they really gonna get counted? You know, I had this drop box. So we took a picture of it, put it right on the website to let people know it was there. Um, and it's worked out really well. We used it for tax payments, water payments, um, food shelf don donations, whatever, people are using it. So I really appreciated the opportunity to have that money to do that. Great, thanks, Georgia. Anyone else on Dropbox? All right, uh, Kathy, go right ahead. We didn't have any type of a Dropbox prior to the November election. And again, the funding that was offered to us to install a Dropbox, I took advantage of and was able to have a Dropbox installed just in two days and it has turned out to be very useful. You know, it, it was used quite a bit for the elections, but because the office is restricting, you know, how many people come in, I get correspondence in there as well. So it was great to have that ability to go ahead and and put it in because we had some support for the funding of it. Great. Thank you all. Um, any other general or specific questions from committee members um, for this great resource here? Samantha Lefebvre, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and so this can be answered by whoever um, would like. So my first question is in reference to the Senate GovOps Committee uh, that was on the 14th. Um, and it, Will Sunning answered the question, but I would like to ask it to the clerks. Um, so he said that there was really no way to determine if someone filled out a ballot for somebody else and sent it back in. And, you know, example, like a spouse um, or me filling it out for my aging parents or if I had an adult child. Um, and so there was no way to protect that. And so I was wondering um, if that occurred anywhere where someone showed up to vote on um, either of the elections and they already had another ballot there. Um, I guess that's like my first question, if that did occur to anybody um, who is here. Uh, Donna. We actually did have it happen um, 
and it seemed to be more, I mean, it, it had, I think there was one where someone voted someone else's ballot. Um, um, but it also was one happened where a lot of ballots came to a house and a lot of the people weren't looking the ballot they took when they went to do it. So even though it was barcoded on the back that this belongs to John, not Sally, John filled Sally's out and Sally may not fill John or Sally filled John. Now John goes to the poll and John's not there. So we had to go looking through um, the envelopes that were returned and say, oh yeah, okay, because it's barcoded. We don't look at the signature. We were just scanning them into the system not matching the name that's the barcode that was on the back with the name versus the name that's on the front of the certificate. It was a lot of flip flopping, which is why when we do ours, everything's on the front. We, we put the voter's name on the front so we can look really quickly. But we probably had five or six that, that happened with, um, and one or two of them I think were done fraudulently. I think the others were just mistakes. Someone voted someone else's ballot but I think the others were, were an attempt and it worked. And thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And so the reason more so I asked is because um, it's great that, you know, Donna caught, you know, you could see what happened, but for the towns where it happened and it wasn't recognized, to me, let's say that it was someone that I know I purchased my house, they have moved away, their ballot came and I filled it out for them they're still going to be on the voter checklist. Um, they're not going to be missing where you send the challenge letter, you know, they didn't respond back. Um, and so what, you know, where's the follow up if that just keeps continuing to happen? Or is that something more that you guys are looking at trying to clear up the checklist? Um, and then, and if they do show up, maybe Donna, you can explain what you did. How do you verify if it was done fraudulently or if there was a mistake or, um, so this is the example of where somebody had a ballot sent in by mail, they showed up to vote in person, and you're like, I'm sorry, you've already voted. How did you follow up with that? How did you figure out if it was fraudulent or if there was a mistake? Um, you know, unfortunately, we get a lot of, and, and this is not a downplay on any say, we get a lot of election training, but we don't get a lot of election fraud training, um, how to detect it. Um, so, and, and, if, and if there is, we have reasons to suspect it, um, what we have heard in the past, and I think things are changing a little bit, was fact, well, you go and investigate. It's, this, is, this is a local issue. This is not our issue. This is a local, you guys need to get your local police department on it. You need to, they're not trained for, for that kind of stuff. Um, and, and that's what I have always heard. Um, and it's, so it gets kind of funky when you get near the election date. Because if somebody sold their house a week prior to the election and they got mailed their ballot like in November, they got it, they moved, and they voted it before they moved. But that doesn't say they didn't go to the new town and register there as well, or a new state, even another whole state. If it was in state, it might be a little bit easier to catch because we did catch some people and actually have two voters who voted in two locations or attempted to, but I caught them. Um, and they were young people, they were, they got their absentee ballot in one town and where they lived and now they registered in South Burlington. So I sent them a ballot because nothing came back yet. And when I went to enter it in the system, they were gone. Um, they voted in the other town, and the other town pulled them from my checklist. Um, so I have two instances where I confirmed with other towns where they actually did vote in both, but I was able to catch the second ballot from going through. And put it aside and, and that's it. And so for the Secretary of State's office, if they want to prosecute further on that, they said, well, let me know what happens. And, and honestly, I haven't heard anything else. But I have not really had the time um, to, to get back with them um, to see if and anything is going to be done. I mean, these were young, I think they were young people, early 20s, who just said, well, I, I didn't always do anything wrong. Um, so, and so it's, it's always that gray area of right around election time. Do I allow them to vote? Do I not? You know, you give them time to vote in the new place or not. It, so there's, there's always those few days just before an election that leads to some chaos and confusion. John Odom. Yeah, we caught one person trying to vote twice. <laughs> 
bounced it up to, to SOS, which I think took it to the, the, the AG's office. Um, doesn't happen very much. Um, you know, what we get is generally anecdotal. So um, it's not something I would put on the front burner. You know, it's um, not to say it's, it's, a, it's a solution looking for a problem because it's always a sort of built in problem to what we do but it's not a big deal. I think there are some due diligence things we could do. I'm not so in favor of allowing the envelope not to be sealed, just sort of out of principle, but I think that's one of those due diligence things you do. Um, but um, yeah, and I mean, another option that I know, I know Secretary Condos would like to do would be some kind of um, Full book option where we can all be essentially working directly into the master database. So it would be possible for somebody to go and vote in two different locations or two different towns. That brings a whole different, you know, bag of worms as far as, you know, security of the databases. But that's, um, you know, that's a direction that could be looked at. Too. And Carol Doss? You know, we had we had one or two that uh, fell into the same sort of category. Um, and what was nice is that um, the Vermont election management system where we data enter all our absentee ballot requests and the, the ballots as they come back, um, it would flag a voter. It wouldn't let you enter um, a ballot back from a voter who already had a returned ballot in the system from another community. Um, and then you would reach out to the clerk and figure out, you know, what was, was there an issue? Was it somebody legitimately, well, not legitimately, but actually trying to vote twice? Or was there some other issue? And we actually had a situation where um, the, the voter hadn't tried to vote twice. What had happened was it, that um, a voter had been pulled from us to be registered in another community, but it was the wrong voter who had been pulled. And so it actually allowed us to make a correction um, in the system so that the voter uh, could have their ballot counted. Um, so the, the statewide system did, did help us with that. But what it does do is it makes you realize that the system is only as strong as the data that's entered into it. And um, we, all of us, were overwhelmed with ballots coming back. So trying to stay on top of the data entry was a challenge for virtually everybody. Thanks, Carol. Anyone else want to jump in on this? All right, I'm going to jump to Mike McCarthy with a question. Oh, sorry, Kathy, did you want to jump in on, um, on potential fraud? I didn't have any potential fraud, but um, that was one of the things that even in a small town, one of the things that I don't know that I mentioned is we don't use a tabulator. And so for all of the absentee ballots that were coming in ahead of time, and again, being a small town, it wasn't overwhelming. And because I work alone, it wasn't overwhelming, but I was able to process the absentee ballots um, prior to election day, which of course helped out. But um, I had a couple of attempts, you know, somebody moved, read it election times, but nothing um, that couldn't be resolved quickly. And I didn't have, I don't think I had any intentional tries. But again, because we hand count everything, most of what, 99.9% .9 of what came in came to my face to me and I was able to de decide because I was keeping on top of things if it was legitimate. All right, any other clerks wanna jump in on the question of double double voting or, or potential fraud? All right, Mike McCarthy has a question and then Mark Higley. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I know here in St. Albans that Curry had a really incredible um, procedure during the last couple of elections to sort of allow people to vote in person safely for those folks who didn't vote early. And I'm, I'm wondering if um, there's been kind of a sharing of those best practices among the clerks and if, if there's been any formalization of those procedures, especially when folks have kind of a similar 
situation because it was really impressive. Uh, and um, Curry's just been fantastic through all of this. Go ahead, Carol. Um, there's tremendous amount of sharing of information, uh, um, particularly amongst the VMCTA. We have the listserv and people put out questions all the time. For myself, um, we did not do uh, indoor voting for the August primary, but, we're, but did for November. And so I reached out to clerks in similar size communities that have similar facilities and asked them for uh, copies of their layout. Um, so I could look at that and, and use it to help me build the layout for my facility. Um, and I know that there were, were similar kinds of, of outreach that were done throughout the season. Great, excellent. Uh, Mark Higley. Yeah, I guess my question would be um, not so much concerning the folks that might be attempting to vote twice, which I can see that there's an opportunity to catch catch that. Uh, I'm a little concerned that uh, the one, the couple that Donna mentioned that uh, could possibly be fraudulent are being investigated by the attorney general or secretary of state. But uh, my concern would be, and I guess the question would be, how do you catch uh, a ballot if ballots are made to all registered voters um, of let's say Uncle Charlie, who's had dementia for the past two years and the folks pretty much uh, understand how Uncle Charlie would vote and they sign it and pretty much know how his signature is and not, not put past anybody, but would you as town clerks be able to catch something like that? And, and again, how important it is, is I go back to races like, you know, the uh, Ainsworth Buxton race twice won and lost by one vote. So one vote is critical. And to me, that's my concern for mailing out all these ballots to every registered voter. So the, the question is, could you catch an individual who signed a ballot uh, for another individual that was debilitated to some degree or whatever the case might be? John Odom. Um, I think it's a great question and I'm actually glad you bring it up because um, there's a point that I like to make to folks a lot. I mean, the short answer to the question is, no, we can't necessarily stop them. Just the same as if we only had in-person voting, we couldn't necessarily stop them uh, from being either told how to vote before they got there or to have someone who is, you know, allowed to accompany them to their poll booth if they, you know, have, you know, limited capacity who would then tell them what, how to vote right then and there. In both those cases, you've got the same situation in both those cases. You know, the system is not going to be foolproof and probably never will be. I think what this points out is that the problems that get tend to get highlighted like that one uh, for the all mail and voting that we talk about are essentially the same problems we already have. They have slightly different flavors to them. Um, and I think it's probably good that the whole mail-in voting thing is sort of bringing up those questions again, because we should always be talking about them and we should always be thinking about them. But the mail-in, it, it doesn't bring anything new to the table in terms of problems like that very one that you need to watch for. Anyone else want to respond to that question? Uh, Georgette and then Bobby. I have to agree with John. I mean, we have elderly folks that come in or spouses that come in that you know that are starting with starting with dementia or have some issue and they have their spouse or their child go to the polling booth with them to help them and try to explain it. In fact, I had to give one man, I think a couple of ballots this last November because he kept making a mistake and his wife kept telling him, no, that's not, you know, and so I get uncomfortable as a clerk listening to it as well, but yet th that, that voter wants that person there. They've asked to have that person come and help them. So um, I, I just don't think that there is a way even with mail-in that it, it's a problem we already have. Definitely, I agree with John. Bobby? I was just gonna add that if someone is 
determined to do that. There's, oh, sorry, my extended warranty is up. Um, it's the third call today. Um, if someone was determined to do that type of fraud, there's nothing now stopping them from requesting an absentee ballot on behalf of that voter and doing it at home. Any other clerks want to weigh in on that? Any other committee members want to ask a question of the assembled wisdom and experience here at local elections administration? Uh, Sam, go ahead. Thank you. And um, I appreciate the clerks and their knowledge. So what, for example, um, if, if it's someone who votes for somebody um, who just doesn't want to vote, um, how is the, you know, what if, what if that's what's happening? Um, hopefully that makes sense. Like what if they're deciding they're just going to skip voting um, and then somebody else fills it out for them? And then I guess my other follow-up is while I have the time, if it's a problem, um, we already have, like, how are we going to fix it? Like, how are we going to ensure that voting is easy to do, but it's impossible um, to cheat? It, any ideas, just throw it out to all the clerks that we have. Um, so I feel like that's a main goal between all of us um, is to work towards that. And I would really like to hear the ideas because we're hearing that there's already the um, problems being acknowledged, but how can we work to fix that? All right, uh, Carol, and then John. I, I I was just going to say that it, you know there at this stage of the game there there isn't any way in our current system that would uh, that would preclude somebody making a request and then voting on behalf of someone who doesn't want to vote. Um, that is. It, you know, as, as we've talked about, whether you're mailing ballots out to people or whether you're mailing them upon request, um, that is uh, an opportunity that's out there. Um, you certainly hope that, that the, the numbers that do that are very, very, very small. And I believe they are very, very, very small. I have had conversations with people before who have called me and said, you know, well, I have grandma's power of attorney and I know how she likes to vote. So send me her ballot and I'll take care of it. And I'm like, no, that's, that's not the way it works. Um, so, you know, we're able to run interference uh, on certain occasions, um, but, uh, but it's not, um, you know, it's not a, a, a completely sealed system kind of thing. There are there are opportunities there. Um, I'm not sure what the, you know, short of what I consider to be some, some rather um, strict, overly strict ways to to um, to conduct elections. You know, I mean, Vermont, uh, I think, prides itself and should pride itself in how. Uh, accessible, we make voting, um, and I'm I'm afraid that if we if we try to find solutions to problems that don't really exist, um, like voter fraud, that we're that we're going to disenfranchise some of our voters. Thanks, Carol. That's uh, that is the the push and pull that I have heard characterized. Uh, John, and then Curry. Uh, sure. I mean, just to essentially echo what Carol said, um, there is no perfect system. Human systems are not perfect. They're not, you know, they have seams. So I think you look at where you need to make the adjustments. I mean, you're, you're hearing from us that attempts at voter fraud are minimal. That, um, that's echoed through all the studies, you know, statewide, no, nationwide, that's just, it's irrefutable at this point. So the question becomes, where do you want to affect that balance in a system that can never be perfect? Do you want to lean it towards the side of everyone who should vote gets to vote? Maybe one or two of those others get through, or do you want to lean it to the side of 
absolutely every cheater, if it's even possible, gets caught, even if that means squeezing out some legitimate votes. It's sort of like the old welfare conversation, right? Cheats versus making sure people get it. I think there is an issue of what is your sort of ethical priority from a policy standpoint, which is more important to you. And for my part, and I think I probably echo most of the clerks, it's more important to make sure that people who have a right to vote get that right to vote. But then just logically looking at it as a problem to be solved, you look at where that issue exists. And right now, as I said, there is virtually no voter fraud. It is a tiny, tiny thing. There's not a problem over there, as Carol said. Now, if that changes, if from our policies or culture or whatever, you start seeing that number of voter frauds come up, then you're gonna see the clerks be the first people to say, whoa, 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 the balance is out. Now let's looking at adjust the policy, maybe to tweak that and bring that back down and fine tune it. But as it stands, it's just not there. So the system, at least in Vermont, is pretty fine tuned. It's pretty tight. I think, I dare say it's as tight as it could possibly be. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think you, you mess with that. I think it's terrific. Curry. Uh, thank you. Yep. In response to, you know, how to really tell, um, you know, if somebody had requested a ballot for you, I just, you know, and Carol had mentioned it too, our Vermont elections management system does have a really great tool on the My Voter page where, you know, Vermont does have ballot tracking. And, you know, it might be an area that, you know, might be able to help if they wanted to do in-person voting and they checked their ballot status and they said, oh, somebody, I didn't vote yet, you know, maybe that might be a, a good tool to expand on, you know, publicize um, that people really can follow the path of their ballot. And, you know, if, whether they know how to use it, if, you know, they're elderly or however, you know, education they might have or internet access, um, but, you know, it is there um, and it is one way that somebody might, you know, catch on if that were to happen. And, and as you're hearing, you know, the incidence of voter fraud is so minimal across the board, but, you know, like, things do happen, but it's just a tool that I really found helpful. And I think a lot of voters were really excited about um, and really put their minds at ease when they did, uh, you know, decide to mail vote or just vote in person that it was there. Donna. I think I've been a clerk for far too long now. Um, um, you know, I've, I've been 20 years in June as being a clerk um, and I, I always, in our hearts as clerks, we want the integrity never to be contested. We want people to know they have complete trust in the election. Um, and so I, have a, I really do have a hard time to guess to be all this fraud things. And, and I think, and kind of harped on is that we've really ne never had any training of how do you find fraud? How do you investigate it? How do you, and, and I think that's something that as we go through and like John's point of, you know, the, that balancing of scales, Yes, and I completely agree with John, but we also have to make it known to people through somehow that we are still watching. It's not, you know, we're not out here doing just la la, whatever happens, it's minimal amount, let's not worry about it. I still think we have to still worry about it and, and tighten things up when we can. And one of the things that really bugs me, and I know the rest of some of my fellow clerks aren't gonna agree, but it's like on election day, when someone comes in to register to vote, they can just walk in and say, hi, I'm Donna Kenville and I live in uh, Marshfield. You now, Barbie, now Bobby will probably catch him because she knows everybody in Marshfield. But if Bobby came to South Burlington and did that, we're not gonna know she's in South Burlington. So I really, you know, what we need to do to find fraud or fraud is, is to make it so we don't disenfranchise people, but we also gotta find ways to make it that the information that we're getting is very, verifiable, I guess if that's the correct word. Um, you know, I, and I keep saying on election day, I, after people register to vote on election day, I send them all a notice saying, welcome to the city and you've been new voter. And there've been some presidential elections that I'll get 15 to 20 of them back. It's not at this address. Now it could be the post office not wanting to deliver, or it could be the fact that no one really truly lives there. Um, so I, I think as we go through this conversation, I think A, we need training more on it. And B, we have to definitely let people know that um, 
you know, we are still watching and tighten things up so that people don't don't sneak in who shouldn't be, but no, don't want to make that balance be this, but make people a little bit more accountable um, on some things. I, I probably have up 2,000 people who registered using a social security number. I can't prove, and they've been on there for 10 years. Um, and they're voting, and, and it, probably majority of them are, but the rest of them are not. Thanks, Donna. Bobby, on this topic? Yeah, I, I was going to suggest, along with what Donna said, that for people to know that we're watching, when we do report something, it needs to be followed up on. I've had and I had an issue in Marchfield only once in 23 years of someone who did not live in my town swearing that they lived in my town and voting. And an hour later, their landlord came in and I just mentioned, oh, I met your tenant. And he said, that person moved out of town five years ago. I reported it, nothing was ever done. I can't say that the person voted twice. I don't know that he voted in another town, but I know he wasn't eligible to vote in my town. And he lied and got to vote because with same day voter, we don't have the time for the mail to come back and find out that they're not really there. So when the, those rare occasions do happen, they need to be investigated. They need to be looked into. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, any other clerks on this issue before I pop it? Oh, Carol, go right ahead and then we'll give Mike Rewicki the last question. Yeah, I, John had mentioned, you know, that, that one of the Secretary of State's goals uh, is to ultimately have us uh, clerks be able to use a live statewide checklist at our polling places for marking people in, um, which would help with any kind of duplication. Um, I took the time in November because we had, I don't know, about 100 people registered to vote. Uh, and I took the time to data enter them into the system before allowing them to vote, which would let me see if they had voted in another community yet, at least absentee. Um, we don't know day of, um, but that, that gave me uh, that opportunity. But it does bring up a, a larger issue, which is not every clerk has internet access at their polling places. And so having that kind of uh, universal access on election day is currently just not possible. Right. <laughs> All right, so Mike Merwicki, you get the last question. I'm trying to learn to lower my hand as I unmute myself one of those protocols. And just quickly to that last question, I'll share what I was, I've been saying for 20 years when it comes to internet access, we're working on it. Um, but I do hope in the next year or so, uh, there's gonna be federal money that's gonna allow us to make some big, big progress here in Vermont. Uh, I appreciate all the work that you do on the ground level here. I know when we wanna find out what's happening, we ask the clerks. And I just wanna hold up a concern uh, that I'm not sure we're having right now, but I don't want to have in Vermont because it's happening nationwide. And uh, the reality is that the, <clears throat> the population of people of color in Vermont is growing. And across the country, the challenge there is voter suppression. And what I want to do at some point, we may come back to you and see what we can do to make sure voter suppression isn't happening here in Vermont as the population of people of color in the BIPOC community grows. So I just wanna hold that concern up to, to think about. And, and as you see, as all of us are seeing more people of color in our small towns and our larger towns, I wanna hold up that concern that, that we get ahead of the curve when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to voter suppression because it, nationwide, I think voter suppression is a much bigger problem than voter fraud. So that, that's the last thing I want to share about that. Thank you. All right, not, not necessarily a question, but definitely a, um, a, a statement that I would give folks an opportunity to answer if they, uh, if they felt they wanted to say something about that. All right, seeing some thumbs up, but 
Uh, anybody who wants to, to jump in, go ahead and unmike um, and respond to that. I have to say that I was overwhelmed when I looked at the news and saw in some of these districts, some of these states where the lines were just so long. And I thought, oh my God, I, I just can't even imagine. It was just unbelievable. People waiting in line for hours all day, you know, no place to go use the bathroom, no place to get water, no place. It's and staying there just so they could have their right to vote. It was, it was pretty amazing to see. Yeah. And it also made me very proud that in Vermont, we did everything we could together from big town to small town, Republican, Democrat, we worked together to, to make sure that people could um, vote safely uh, and didn't have to uh, spend, you know, three to six hours standing in line on election day um, in order to do that. Uh, John Odom. Yeah, just really, really briefly. Um, you know, I had a situation um, this time, or, uh, you know, I had uh, a candidate on the ballot for a JP, his name was Jose. Um, put that into it, got the proof back, you know, it has the stress mark over the E, and the ballots all came back JOS. And it's because the actual printer, even though it showed up correctly on uh, the proof, couldn't handle that. So it just spat out all my ballots. I had to contact him and say, oh my God, it's, you know, I'll redo the ballots. And, you know, he was okay with it. But I think the biggest, maybe the biggest thing we all need to think about, at least at the local level with the, the, the concern is making sure folks feel welcome as part of the community to vote. If they, you know, if, if they're new to the community, maybe they're not as, you know, lily wide as we are. Um, and that's just an example of a, of a tiny little way that the system locally, my system, might have made him feel unwelcome. And I just feel terrible about that. So I think that's the kind of thing we can do at our level. Curry? And just to add, you know, I, when we went forward with mailing ballots to everyone, you know, one of the first things I thought of was that it's such an inclusive way um, to have, you know, people voting, you know people who aren't necessarily able to take that time off work or, um, you know, if they needed the extra time to ask more questions, you know, they got their ballot. Um, and I just really, really liked that. Thank you all. Um, and I want to just give a great big hearty thank you to, uh, to this uh, assembly of clerks who have given us a couple hours out of their their work week and I know that these are precious hours because the list of things that you have in front of you is uh, is always long but uh, we do so very much appreciate this because um, one of the most important uh, areas of jurisdiction for this committee is elections law and uh, it was really important to us to get this debrief with you so that we could hear uh, what was good, what was bad, what would you change, what would you keep the same? Um, and so I guess I would welcome you to uh, to follow up with an email if you think of anything that, uh, that came up in the conversation today that you didn't get to share with us. Um, and do please stay in touch with the legislative process. Um, if we are as a state going to decide that this experiment in mailing a ballot to everyone is a good thing and, uh, and we wanna keep doing it, that bill is gonna to need to move this year. So we wanna keep our eyes on, uh, on any lessons learned um, and how to share best practices and how to uh, you know, minimize the snags, what, whatever those may be. So thank you all for your time here with us today and I very much appreciate it.